Welcome to the Daybreak with Jeff Slakey podcast. I'm so happy you found us. Please subscribe, rate, review, and share this with your circle of influence. It's a collection of the interviews, news, and conversation during Daybreak with Jeff Slakey on iFiber One News Radio, KMAS, weekdays from 6 to 9. Good Thursday morning to you. The Daybreak Show rolls on. It's final debate day. Good morning, Spencer. How are you? I'm doing great. Good morning to you. Are you ready for your debate tonight? You know, I um, I think I may be busy doing something else. I have to look at my schedule. Oh, yeah. Right. It says right here I'm busy. I'm not going to be able to partake. So. <laughs> busy doing anything else. Yes. Now, it'll be a big night tonight as it's the final matchup between President Trump and Vice President Biden. We'll have it here on the radio for you as we are less than two weeks away from Election Day. Today on the show, we're going to have a great conversation. It's kind of a a two-parter in a sense with the uh, city representation for the Mason County LEAD program, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program. This is a new program that's started in the last couple of weeks. It's got a three-year pilot program run here. And the aim is to take folks who may be um, involved in low-level crimes, and before they get into the system and things like that, there's an opportunity for them to go get counseling and help they need uh, to help them get on the right path. So today's conversation is uh, with Lieutenant Kostad from the police department for the city, uh, city manager Jeff Knighton, and Jeffrey Bean Mortensen from Olympic Health and Recovery Services to talk a little bit about this from the city perspective. Check out our website, iFiber One, uh, for the county conversation, and that has Mason County Commissioner Kevin Schutte, Abe Gardner, uh, Prosecutor Michael Dorsey, and Under Sheriff Travis Adams talking about this program as well. So that's what's coming up today. It's also National Make a Dog's Day, so that's going to be a fun one as we talk about that. What's the weather look like out there today? Uh, Sunshine and clouds mixed, a high of about 55. And tomorrow will be the only rainy day, like in the next seven days, supposedly. So I thought that earlier in the week you were kind of teasing me a bit with some possibilities of colder conditions it's certainly cold in the early mornings but then any sort of flirting with flurries it looked like it uh, on monday it looked like this coming monday it's a slight chance of uh, snow showers in the morning and now they're saying mostly sunny and it doesn't look like it so there's no no indications of any type of snow shower or anything else in the next seven days at least Oh, thank goodness. Mason County Public Health notified of eight additional Mason County residents testing positive for COVID-19. There are currently 52 active cases. One is hospitalized in the county. We reported on the additional death yesterday, now bringing the total to nine. And uh, that's the latest here. The Centers for Disease Control yesterday, Spencer, expanded its definition of who is considered a close contact of an infected individual. So now they are defining close contact as someone who has been within six feet of an infected person for 15 minutes or more across a 24-hour period. Hmm. The guidance was previously described as 15 consecutive minutes within six feet of an infected individual. So that's a big change there on the definition of close contact. Please do whatever you can to uh, reduce the spread, uh, wear your face coverings, six feet of distance, anything as we move into the fall and winter. I believe we've got a conversation for Monday with Dr. Stein, the health officer, and Dave Windham, health director for Mason County, to talk about these uptick in numbers and to see what they're looking at for the fall. Well, it looks like there was an incident. Uh, Members of the Mason County multi-jurisdictional SWAT team served a high-risk warrant in the Grapeview area. Suspect was taken into custody without incident or injuries. Detectives recovered several loaded firearms and a significant amount of ammunition. That's all the information we have right now, but we'll continue to monitor and bring you the latest with that story. We just want to remind everybody that the Mason County Board of Commissioners were able to 
put some funds into the local PUDs for help. Mason County PUD number one received just shy of $50,000. Mason PUD three received $300,000. These are funds to assist Mason County uh, water and electric residential accounts uh, for PUD one, electric accounts for PUD three, Check out their websites. Uh, we've got an interview on our website, ifiber1newsradio.com, and our Facebook page. So share that with people within the county. It's a very important, and uh, if you've been impacted by COVID, this can help. Uh, COVID-19 related financial hardships apply for this for your utilities. Lisa Frazier, the Mason County Treasurer, would like to let taxpayers know that there is no COVID-19 second half property tax due date extension. Second half property tax payments for the year 2020 are due on or before Monday, November 2nd. Uh, October 31st falls on a Saturday, as we've discussed this year. Delinquent interest of 1% will be charged on Tuesday, November 3rd. In-person property tax payment transactions should be limited to only those transactions that cannot be handled alternatively such as cash. Taxpayers are strongly encouraged to use the following options for making their second half property tax payments, driving up and using the property tax payment drop box online or over the phone or by mail. More information on the assessor's website for the county. Secretary of State Kim Wyman issued the following statement after federal intelligence officials held a brief announcement last night on interference in the upcoming election. Foreign adversaries are working around the clock to interfere in U.S. elections and undermine confidence in the electoral process. Despite the disinformation circulating from bad actors, uh, there has been no indication of compromise at the Office of Secretary of State within our election systems for the state of Washington. As of yesterday, 25% of Washington voters have already returned their ballots for the upcoming election. Wyman encourages everybody who has not yet vote early and place it in an official ballot drop box. There's 10 around Mason County. Ballots returned by mail must be postmarked by Election Day, November 3rd. And again, we've got the big debate tonight. Uh, Spencer, what time? We're going to have our pregame show at, what, 5? And the debate's at 6? This is going to be a big one, final one here. Yes. Both candidates ready, you think? Yeah, you know, I think they're going to be as ready as they're going to be. And it's so odd to think that we are uh, now well under two weeks away from uh, this big election happening. But yeah, the yeah, start time is 6. We'll have kind of that pregame show starting at 5 with analysis afterwards, too. I noticed that uh, uh, the president, President Trump, is really ramping up his uh, rallies. I think he's been telling his aides that he wants to do maybe five rallies a day between now and Election Day to help to try to get out the vote there as he's looking, you know, for some of those key states that he was able to pick up last time around and hopefully keep him in the presidency, whereas uh, Vice President Biden is looking to flip back some of those states that perhaps may have gone to President Obama in those two elections and then flip to Trump. It's an exciting time here as we're really in the home stretch. I mean, you know, it's just amazing to think about when we started all this back in March. I mean, that was was like seven months ago, Spencer. Mm -hmm. And how quickly it seems to have flown by with all of us becoming as customed as we can to this to this new normal. Yeah, I mean, I had a full head of hair, as you know. The listeners, some of me know, back in March, and then yeah. all this happened, yeah. and uh, I'm Lex Luthor now. I mean, the Yeah, you look like Bozo the Clown, now so, you're yeah. Lex Luthor. <laughs> Bozo the Clown. <laughs> Wait, before or after? Which was the Bozo? <laughs> Pre-COVID Drop or the, post-COVID? The clown part, and you're good to go. You're right. <laughs> All right, more Daybreak coming up today. It's a National Make a Dog's Day, so we're going to have a fun conversation about that. I think I may repost on our Facebook page that fascinating in-depth conversation I had many years ago with our own Mr. February, Mr. Winston. That always brings a smile to my oh, face. Oh, yes. And then the, remember that one, and then the lead conversation again from the city's perspective the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program. Check out our website for the county side of that conversation. More Daybreak coming up. 
from the iFiber One News Radio Studios, you're listening to Daybreak. How's it going, everybody? Jeff Slakey from iFiber One, and we're continuing our conversations today about the Mason County Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program lead. Uh, we talked a little bit of, with folks from the county. Uh, we're going to do some city conversations here today about this. City Manager Jeff Knighton here uh, with us from Olympic Health and Recovery Services. Jason Bean Mortensen is here, and then uh, Lieutenant Colstead is here from the Shelton Police Department. Let's start with you, Dave, and talk a little bit about this program and how you have uh, presented it to the fellow officers in the Shelton Police Department, and then what they do out and about when it comes to uh, the LEAD program. Initially, uh, when we started this program, um, uh, we were proposed with this uh, new referral process um, by Olympic Health and Recovery and Mason County Health. And um, we jumped on board, and um, essentially what we're doing now with the city is uh, our officers, when we're out in the field and we're making contacts, whether it be social or arrest contacts, we're able to, um, instead of uh, throw them directly into a court system or jail or anything like that, we're able to identify their needs up front um, and and hopefully get them the help up uh, right there and then and, and get them in the place they need so uh, we can better assist them. You know, we talked over the years about even just the need for space and space availabilities. I know that the city uh, uh, has some space in the in the Mason County Jail, but it's very limited numbers of people, and, and oftentimes the jail there is, is full, and so you can't really even get somebody in there. So when this first initial contacts and these crimes, they are crimes. This is not a get-out-of-jail-free card if somebody gets uh, contacted by law enforcement, but they see something happening, uh, an officer uh, approaches that person, and then w- how do they make the determination to move to those next right. and, and And that's totally up to the officer on how they want to proceed with that. Um, they would begin with identifying if there was uh, potentially a substance abuse pro- uh, problem or maybe a mental health issue that this person needed some more assistance with, and then they would, they would talk to that individual and ascertain if they wanted to... Um, be involved with that program at that point in time, and then they'd make the referral service from then. So, Jason, talk to me a little bit about Olympic Health and Recovery Services and then that aspect of it. Are you on uh, in the field with law enforcement, or does this come in a phone call uh, after that initial contact? How does that work? So typically the response is um, a call from law enforcement, and as much as possible, we want to respond right there in that moment. Um, ideally uh, to the scene while law enforcement is still there. But the other piece of that is we don't want to tie law enforcement up. So if it's a safe situation and things are stable, law enforcement can take off. We'll go wherever somebody is. Um, If it's a homeless camp, we'll go out to a homeless camp. Um, If there was a last known location, we'll go out and try to find the person. Um, But our goal really is to engage as quickly as possible while that moment of willingness is there. And then what's the process like um, through this diversion program? What are the types of things would, would the person have to complete in order to successfully go through the program? So we're, we're kind of taking a harm reduction approach. So they don't necessarily need to follow a, a strict compliance-based model like they might in like a drug court program or something like that. Um, it really is person-centered. And we're trying to meet with the individuals, figure out what would help them most, kind of stabilize in their, life, in their lives. Um, and, and so far, we've already helped people with, you know, rain gear for their employment, um, looking at housing options. Uh, ultimately, we would like to get people to a point where they want to go through treatment in a formal sense, but um, it really is just kind of walking alongside that person, getting them to reduce harm in their lives, and um, ultimately have less contact with law enforcement and generally have a, a stable recovery going forward. Jeff, I talked with County Commissioner Schutte yesterday about what made this attractive to the county commissioners to, to bring this on board. I'm going to ask you the same thing when it comes to the city. I think it's important that, uh, number one, that we uh, address the issues uh, as they pop up, and this program does that. It's an evidence-based system. It's worked in other areas, uh, and it's very, uh, uh, very effective at reducing law enforcement contacts. The other part uh, that makes it attractive is the collaboration, the community collaboration between Mason County, the Public Defender's Office, the uh, Mason County Prosecutor's Office, Sheriff's Department, our Police Department, and the city. I think it's a community-based approach that we can help uh, friends and neighbors and other citizens of the, uh, the Shelton Mason County community um, have better outcomes, uh, produce better outcomes for the people uh, that we're helping and the community itself. 
And Lieutenant, these aren't necessarily, um, it doesn't have to just be when you see a crime happening. There's other opportunities for folks to uh, be proactive in maybe uh, identifying a person who could be good for this. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the police department gets numerous calls a day, and not necessarily they're all crime-related um, assistance calls or whatever that be. And so merely that those social contacts, we can derive referrals just from those if we identify a need for the system. And Jason, over the course of the last seven months or so, have you seen the, the needs uh, dramatically increase, kind of stay the same, or, or where, where are we at in how COVID has played into a part of all this? Yeah, so generally across the system, there's been a lot of projections from the Department of Health and others about an increased need. And especially over the last, you know, two, three months, we've noticed an increase in needs, specifically in the crisis services system. Um, and this program specifically could help address some of that crisis need as well. Um, but yeah, there, there's an increased need for behavioral services right now, for sure. It's a, a multi-year uh, grant-funded program, so uh, we'll see longevity on this and, and get to some good numbers. And you mentioned elsewhere across the state and the country these are uh, uh, in action and seem to be working. Do you have any other, any of you really have any other s uh, stats or, or anecdotal stories that have come from this that somebody was able to really see that change where they went one path when they could have gone the other? I mean, so far, the, the original model, um, they, a big study they had showed, I think it was a 58% reduction in recidivism, which is pretty outstanding. Um, and, and just so far, like I mentioned, we've got a couple individuals that we've only been working with for you know, maybe a month that are beginning to make changes on their own and then report back to the case managers, hey, I went and did this thing, or you know, I'm beginning, I reached out to support enforcement and I'm taking care of that. And um, it's, it's really exciting to see people have that autonomy and motivation to begin improving their lives. And I think that uh, if it, you know, it bears out to be a half 50% recidivism, that's a pretty good number for you guys. We absolutely love that number, yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, notoriously, the police department, we, we do, uh, most of our um, activities sometimes surround uh, just a minute percentage of the community. And if we can get those, those people help and off, that would definitely help us out. It seems to be a, a great program that has been going on for a little while now and will continue for, for a few years here in Mason County. It's the Mason County LEAD Program, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program. You can find more information about this uh, on the county's website through public health as well. There's links from the city too. Uh, again, in the previous conversation we had with the county officials, uh, we talked with Dave Gardner there and he's got contact information. We'll share that in here uh, as well. So again, a reminder to folks, this is not a get out of jail free card. So at what point is there a determination that somebody is not successfully completing these and then Lieutenant has to come back in here on this? Is that how that works or? Well, so the charge would be referred to the prosecutor's office and it's essentially just kind of held at that point. Um, the individual needs to follow up typically within 30 days to get fully engaged in the program. And at that point, if they're fully engaged, they're making progress, uh, the prosecutor gets to just kind of let that charge go. Um, we do regular staffings where we talk about how cases are going. So if there's a need for an extension for some special reason, the prosecutor has the option to do that. But typically we want to see somebody engaged and, and rolling within 30 days. Again, the Mason County LEAD program will have information and the links to this so you can find out more information. Again, City Manager for the City of Shelton, Jeff Knighton, uh, Jason Bean Mortensen from Olympic Health and Recovery Services, and Lieutenant Colstad from Police Department. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. You're listening to Daybreak on iFiber One News Radio. Good morning to you. It is the 22nd all day today, and here's a good one. National Make a Dog's Day Day. Good morning, Spencer. How you doing? I'm all right. How are you? <laughs> you going to do the Sorry. whole bit okay. like this? No, don't worry. <laughs> it's National Make a Dog's Day on today, an opportunity to give all dogs the best day of their life. So, if you have the opportunity, and of course you have to check in with COVID on this, but uh, adopt a pet in Mason County. Uh, there's all sorts of shelters around. If you could uh, um, help adopt a pet, man, that would be something great to have a... It, I, I think back to when I went to adopt a pet 
we saw Simon. We'll start, we'll start with Simon and saw the pictures and says, oh my gosh, what a beautiful dog. And so we went to adopt a pet and met him and brought him home. And it's amazing. And you see this too on videos where the dog will be at the shelter mm-hmm. behind the cage or whatever. And they just look down and dejected. And then it's the picture of them in the car on the way oh, yeah. home. It is just, I almost am crying every time I see that stuff. Yeah, they really do light up. People say it's its just wishful thinking, but it isn't. They, the, their demeanor completely changes when they've gone from the routine of a shelter to, you know, not that they're not well taken care of there, but they want, you know, they want a forever home. So, Sure. And... Then with Winston, the same thing. We saw the pictures of him at Adopt-A-Pet. I brought Simon out so they could meet. And on the way home, just looking at the face, I mean, you could just tell that they knew that something great was happening. Yeah, they smile from ear to ear. They just, they have these grins on their faces. There's no doubt about it. One thing that I've always contemplated, but it could be emotionally tough unless we figure it out. But I have been thinking about what if what would it be like if we started to adopt dogs who were not puppies, you know, they're adult, older dogs, just a, maybe a few years left of, of life and, you know, to give them their best remaining days. I think that would be powerful and rewarding. It would also be emotionally, um, there'd be a toll on that, don't you think? Yeah, I've seen that every once in a while. You'll see people that uh, will adopt a whole bunch of older animals, and it's almost like a little retirement home. It's kind of cute, and it's touching to see these dogs that, you know, they're they're kind of wearing down, wearing out like we all do as we get older, and kind of given a second chance and just being loved and maybe even spoiled and... You figure a lot of these dogs don't have a whole lot of time left, so just, you know, spoil them. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, puppies and younger dogs, smaller dogs often get picked up faster than older dogs. And I think that's kind of the the, the reasoning behind that a little bit. But all dogs, you know, all dogs are special. All dogs are good boys and good girls. Um, you just got to love them and love them and love them. It's amazing what you see these dogs and they're matted or whatever on the side of the road. You see the pictures of this and then they get a haircut and mm-hmm. and a bowl of food and, and their whole demeanor just changes and it's pretty, it's pretty special. Yeah. So it's a good day today to give a little extra love to your, uh, to your dog today. Maybe uh, if you haven't gone to a dog park and you feel comfortable and socially distanced, maybe if it's you know nice out, take them to a dog park or get them a new toy or, or something. Yeah. The other thing, too, is just maybe look back at your records and figure out whether or not you're up to date on your checkups and your vaccinations and stuff like that. So that's another way that you give the dog their best life is to just make sure that they are able to stay healthy. That's a fun one. National Make a Dog's Day day today. So uh, hello to all the good dogs out there. Do you want to translate that to to dog ease so they know what you're saying? (laughs) What? That's funny. All right, more Daybreak Show coming up. Thank you so much for listening to today's Daybreak with Jeff Slakey podcast. Again, I'm so happy and honored you found us and chose to listen. Please subscribe, rate, review, and share this with your circle of influence. It's a collection of some of the interviews, news, and conversation during Daybreak with Jeff Slakey on iFiber One News Radio KMAS weekdays from 6 to 9. Thank you so much again and talk with you next time.